Well, hello, everybody. Here's chapter 19 for you. This is the second time I'm recording it. Not that you can see the first time, but, oh, man, I did it, and I spent some time doing it, and I was really super happy with it. I did it in the lab this afternoon, and <laughs> the audio stopped working, I think probably because I didn't save it in time. So lesson learned for all of you that email me in the middle of the night when your projects fail or, oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this over. Well, it happens to us as instructors too, but I'm not complaining about it. I'm just staying up very late to get it done so that you have it for class tomorrow. I'll uh, have a little extra caffeine in the morning to make up for it. But now let's get to the fun stuff. Let's go over this again. You're coming to you live from Mr. G's kitchen. You can see this lovely picture of a... Uh, Doc, <laughs> looking over a lake. Uh, that's what's going on in my kitchen. I'm not going to give you the grand tour, but I am going to give you some stuff from a chapter that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, reason being is because we have spent the last few weeks talking about the body. We've talked about anatomy, physiology, kinesiology. We've talked about program design. Um, all that's great. Those are the things that you need to know to be successful at this, right? That's the knowledge that you need so that you can actually help people. But that's not the whole story. In fact, I've told you before, I don't even think that that's the most important part. Now, maybe that's controversial, um, but I believe that all that can be learned. It's knowledge, it's important knowledge. It's something that you need to have. But the other side of the coin, this is the part that really kind of helps you to be successful and that's how to work with people. Now look, I'm not gonna be able to teach you this in the 30 minutes that I'm gonna be talking, but I can give you some things that are beneficial to you that might help you and um, stuff to think about along the way. So let's talk about lifestyle modifications and behavioral coaching. These are ways to actually make sure that the clients that you have are ready to do what you want them to do and will keep doing what you want them to do. Designing a program is easy. I think you're all seeing that now. Once you understand all the concepts which we've been going through step by step, chapter by chapter, page by page, once you figure that out, design is easy. Putting it to use in real life and keeping people coming back so not only do they benefit and they get the benefit, they get the adaptations that they look for, whether it's muscle gain or fat loss or weight loss, they want to be better at their sport. You can do all those things, but are you going to be able to keep them? Are you going to be able to keep them happy? And are you going to be able to do this professionally and make money doing it? So this chapter is focused a little bit more on that. So again, we talked the body, but it's not just about the body. You got to have that, but you also need a working knowledge of psychology, motivation, what drives people, how to tap into that, the individual differences of person to person and how to kind of pull their motivation from them. Peak performance, how to facilitate the right set of circumstances so that someone can perform at their peak. And then how to facilitate lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes are not losing 10 pounds so you can fit into a bathing suit because it's summertime. That's a goal, sure, it's achievable, but it doesn't really change anything that's gonna benefit your health long-term. So that's what we're talking today. We're talking about some stuff that actually can help people from the long game. This isn't just about the short game. So here we go, some stats that show up usually first week of almost every single class that we have, but they bear mentioning again here because they're gonna set the stage for what we're gonna be talking about. Three out of four, 75% of U.S. adult population does not partake on a daily basis in 30 minutes of low to moderate physical activity. Really think about yourself here. Think about just even in the confines of our classroom. How many of you actually get that kind of activity every day like you're supposed to? I know I don't. I don't sit and pretend that I do. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but 
I'm, you know, an example, I think, of a typical working American. You know, I'm a father. I work. Uh, I work extra so that I can provide for my family. Work doesn't give a lot of time off. There's no breaks. Like, when are you supposed to do all this? I commute 60 miles each way. Finding the time. Again, these are my excuses, and we're going to talk about excuses as we go through this chapter, but that's what's going on out there. So if I'm here, and I'm a sports medicine instructor, and I'm telling you this. So if I'm having these issues, what do you think the rest of the population is? So it's estimated that 75% really aren't doing what they're supposed to. So we're going to look at some ways for you as an aspiring health and fitness professional to help motivate your clients and bring them closer to being able to exercise, so making sure that they're successful in the first place. And then once they start getting them to adhere, to stick to those programs, it's not all about getting them started or getting to some small goal. It's about making sure that they have a fitness journey that is part of their life that is going to benefit their health, health for the long term. So we'll look at the characteristics of a positive client experience beginning the process of exercise. So what kind of makes it appealing in the first place? How important your initial session is. That's a really big deal. And the importance of effective communication. So let's talk about what clients want. Now everybody's a little different, but there are some basic wants that are pretty uniform across the board. When you walk in, you've got about 20 seconds to make a good first impression. So what does a first impression really include? A couple of different things. Eye contact. That shows confidence. That shows connectedness. You want to look somebody in the eye. This next one here, all right, this one I'm going to spend some time on. I know it might not seem like a big deal when you're looking at it, but... I'm going to give you some opportunities here to use this to your benefit right now. Uh, and don't forget it because you can use it really to benefit you in your life, even if you're not going to be a personal trainer. And that's introducing yourself by name, right? That's easy. Getting the client's name. Table that for just a few minutes from now. Smile. Don't fake it. Make sure that your smile is plastered to your face so because that shows positivity. It shows friendliness, warmth. Shake hands. Uh, in our bachelor's program, we've got sports business management. And in that class, we actually do some mock interviews. You actually do your resume. You put it up on Indeed. Heck, one of our students, our former student ambassador, Richard, I made him do this this past summer for a class. He complained and dragged his feet, didn't want to do it. But Mrs. Rose stayed on his butt about it. He put it up there. And even though he wasn't really looking, he started getting some phone calls and now the guy's working and he got a full-time position actually at one of our externship sites, but all these places called him because we made him do this. Reason I tell you that is because that was one skill we worked on, but another one was during the mock interview, we looked at all this other stuff, including a good handshake. Like I can't teach it to you over a computer, but a good handshake is important. You don't want to iron grip somebody, but you don't want to fish hand somebody either. So a nice firm positive handshake with eye contact, smiling, whole nine. Now's where I'm going back to the name thing. Someone gives you their name, you want to remember it, and you also want to use it. And so here's what I want you to do right now as you're sitting here. There was a book, this is a concept that is very, very old. Um, there was a book that my father asked me to read when I was a teenager, and it's a self-help book that's been around, gosh, since at least the 1920s. I want to say maybe even earlier. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Now, it's not meant for like desperate people that don't know how to interact with other human beings, but it was really designed for business people to kind of figure out how to foster good business relationships. And truth be told, very little of what a good business relationship is has to do with business. It has to do with some of the things I'm talking to you about in this very chapter that I'm lecturing you on right now. But one of the biggest things in there, and I don't know the quote verbatim. I don't have the book here in front of me. I had a copy that I was looking at earlier today while I was at school because I have a copy at work. Um, but it goes something like this. It says, the sound 
of a person's name is to that person the sweetest sound in the world. So that's why it's important that you should use someone else's name. And if you're watching this right now, which I've assigned you to do, and I really hope in all earnesty that you are watching this, here's what I want you to do. That book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I want you to go onto our Blackboard page, go into the discussion section, go under the Ask Questions discussion that's just in the course, and put up a post and just write, the title and author of that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Now listen, don't tell your other classmates that you're doing it. Everyone should have to watch this and there's a reason why I'm doing it. If you go on and post it, I will give you five bonus points on your exam three grade. Five points just for showing that you're paying attention. And I want you to remember this lesson. Not only am I having you write that book down, I'm encouraging you to pick up a copy and read it. You can get it cheap on Amazon or something like that. They've got copies in our library. I know that for a fact. But remember what I'm saying to you here. And this is something that I'm not good at from a business standpoint. I'm really not good at remembering people's names. A lot of times people will tell me and within three minutes I've forgotten it and I'm just calling them a generic pronoun and it's a real disservice. If you can remember somebody's name and use it, that's going to be huge and powerful because people love the sound of their own name. Think about yourself. If we took a group picture in class, right, or we took a big group picture from Kaiser and you get that picture back that shows all the students in all of Kaiser University all together, who's the first person you're going to look for in that group photo? It's yourself because you value yourself above all others. That's not being a narcissist. That's just kind of being a human being. We all have a little bit of that. So you using someone else's name is super important. Go ahead, post that book title, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie in the discussion board forum. Um, do that and uh, I'll give you five points. So there you go. It's a benefit to watch these videos. This is not just Mr. G saying, oh, you should watch these. I'm not recording this late in the middle of the night for my own health. I want to help you guys. And then finally, use good body language. And we'll talk more about that too. So what else are they looking for besides attitude, behavior, good communication, some other things that they're going to look for. Number one, personal trainers need to look good. Uh, what do I mean by that? Looking professional, neat, clean, well-dressed, nice clothes that match. You know, some of you guys that have socks that don't match, your, your outfit needs to be on point. I know that sounds kind of silly, but it shows that you care. Uh, it shows professionalism. And clients look for that. And look, the other thing, if you're going to be a personal trainer, and they're not saying this in here, but let's face it, this is kind of a vain industry. There's vanity. You should look like a personal trainer. You know, people are going to be more hesitant to accept you if you look not like a personal trainer. Like even me these days, look, I'm not fooling anybody. In fact, I'm embarrassed sometimes to come in the classroom because I'm not living a lifestyle that is in sync with the subject that I teach you with what I make a living from. I'm teaching you exercise science and I'm not exercising. I'm not eating right. We know that that's an issue that's kind of plagues everybody. But at the same time, I'm very fortunate that my end of the spectrum is different. I'm giving you education and yes, I can do all of it. I'm not making my money off of making a first impression on clients and, and keeping them to keep working out with me. It's a little bit different. If I was, I don't think I'd be very successful with the kind of uh, eating habits and just the way my body is right now. I would really have to step it up a notch. This isn't me shaming anybody, but if people are coming to you trying to get fit and be fit, they want to look good. They want to look neat and professional, and they're looking for you to set that example. So that's an expectation that's there. It's not just about you know how big or small you are, but again, your outfit, neat, clean, well-dressed. That's why we have the uniform that we do. I know you guys complain about it sometimes, but it's pretty close to what the, most of the uniforms look like out in the industry and tucking things in and looking good and clean. That's the name of the game. They want personal trainers to take time and build relationships with them. Look, that's more what this is than anything. You can build a good program. But people are going to keep coming back to you if they like you. And that's going to be based on the relationship you build with them. And then clients need to feel that the personal trainer is listening to them. 
That's all anybody ever wants. Nobody wants to hear you talk. I know you all don't want to hear me talk, but unfortunately that's the kind of format that we operate in from a school standpoint. But if I was your personal trainer, if I wanted to be a good personal trainer for you, I would speak less and listen more because that's what they want. Other things, confidentiality. You're gonna learn all kinds of really sensitive information about people. Keep it under your hat, be a professional. There's laws about it too. So maintain confidentiality, ensure that there's safety all the time. Be friendly, warm, interested, compassionate. Those are things that, those are words I can say to you. I can show you them. I think I'm good at a lot of these, I, I hope so. But that's not stuff that you can't, that you can fake. If you're not warm, if you're not interested, if you're not compassionate, you're not gonna be able to fool anybody. Collaborate with clients regarding their exercise routine. Look, I mean, you guys designed OPT models. I know a lot of you are doing your projects today while you're watching this. Some of you have already done them. You can put together great workouts, but collaborate with your clients. As you get to know them, find out what they like, find out what they don't like. Give them what they need, but also give them what they want. That's a collaborative atmosphere. Here we go, another thing on the rubric, model all exercises, explain correct alignment and form. So show them what they're doing and make sure that you're giving all those good coaching cues. Draw in, brace, squeeze your glutes, you know, don't let your hips sag, keep your head up, keep your chin tucked, whatever the case may be, whatever compensation they're doing, make sure you're fixing them. That's what they want, that's what they're paying you for. You're not there to just count reps, let them count you focus on their body so that they're doing this right. Quality movement. And then ask a lot of good questions and give a comprehensive initial assessment. You wanna know everything about their capabilities. That's why assessment's important. And then ask a lot of good questions because people aren't gonna necessarily open up about everything. So finding out the kinds of questions you wanna ask, those are gonna be important. Where you are, what kind of setting you work in. We're gonna have classes that we talk more about this, but like lots of gyms, some of you have been to a few different ones in your life, I'm sure, they're all different. And they all uh, kind of cater to different audiences and have a different clientele. So the, uh, the environment in which a personal trainer works is a reflection of who they are as a personal trainer, and that will also determine the kinds of clients that you're going to receive. So it's a little bit about you and it's a little bit about the environment that you're working into. Things to look for in your clients, okay? Well, things that can help with adherence for your clients. Number one, having a lot of different options for people to choose from. So people like choices, people want variety. A supportive, nurturing environment. You don't wanna punish anybody, you don't wanna make anybody feel bad or guilty. That's not gonna work. Convenient location, look, you can be really good, but if you're in a bad area, ain't nobody gonna come to you, at least not for long. Location, location, location. It's not just a fancy saying in business, that's a real thing, pay attention to it. And then cost of membership and cost of personal training. Now here's what I'm gonna say to you on that. You don't wanna necessarily break the bank, right? Like having really expensive personal training and really expensive memberships, that caters to a specific audience um, and you're not gonna catch everybody. But here's the other side of that. If it's too cheap, people won't value it. So you really need to look at some of those other things like the options, the supportive nurturing environment, the kinds of personal connection that you make with someone. You're building the value of your brand, of your service. Your service costs something and there should be skin in the game. There should be an investment from your clients so that they actually want to come and be there with you. Why do you think the Planet Fitness model works so well for them? There are some things that I genuinely like about Planet Fitness. I think their facilities are nice. They've got lots of great equipment. If you just wanna go in and get a quick workout and you know what you're doing, that's a great spot. You're not gonna pay a lot of money. But their model is based on the fact that it's $10 a month. Because if you pay $10 a month for your membership, and you skip a couple days at the gym, do you even care? Like $10, if you go, which you shouldn't go, but if you go to the food trucks that we have outside of Kaiser on any given lunch day, it costs $10 just to get a meal from one of the roach coaches outside. That's 10 bucks. So that's one meal. 
that's not a big deal. So you can go an entire month, months and months, and that $10 that comes out of your bank account automatically deducted every month, you don't even feel that. You're paying 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, $100 a month for a gym membership. Do you think you're going to skip that many days? I'm going to get my money's worth. That's the attitude that people have. So you got to find that right balance based on what you offer. It does have value, but if you go too high, you lose people too. So make sure you find the right sweet spot. And if you work for someone, a lot of that work's already done. But if you work on your own, you take some clients privately, keep this in mind. So someone wants to start exercising. This is the stages of change model. In the psychology class, we talk a lot more about this. We talk about who invented it, why it's relevant, what some of the research is. But here's a couple of things you need to know. And this is, people can um, cycle through these five stages of change, right? This was established a long time ago, five stages. The first one is pre-contemplation. These are people that don't exercise and they are not looking to start. No desire at all. Um, in the next six months, nope, why would I do that? Fat, dumb, and happy is the way to go, right? That's a lot of the attitude. Uh, I've gotten into that poisonous kind of attitude. Like, nope, not right now, not, not interested, just doesn't fit my lifestyle, sorry. Not on my radar. It's stage one. Uh, the best st strategy, if you talk to anybody that's a stage one kind of person, education, you don't want to badger anybody because then they get annoyed and they're not, really not going to come to you because you're just going to drive them further away. But, you know, sometimes when people hear something and they hear it from a fresh perspective, they didn't know about it, maybe they'll come around. Then there's people in the contemplation stage. People at this stage, they don't exercise, right? So it's not too different in that regard, but they're thinking about it. They're giving it some serious thought. Um, people in this stage that have like a curiosity or want to know more, these are the kinds of people that you as a health and fitness professional can actually influence. Uh, you can help them choose what to do and you can also drive them towards things not to do. And so be careful there. Preparation. That's just what it sounds like. People are getting ready. People in this stage that are getting ready to really make exercise a part of their life, they exercise a little bit here and there, you know, not regularly, but occasionally. But in the next month or so, all right, as soon as I'm done with this thing with work, I'm, that's it. I'm getting in the gym. I'm starting a new plan. They believe in the health benefits of exercise, so you don't need to sell them on that. They know that there's good reasons to do it. And then people here, though, and this is where we need to kind of think about this part. They might have unrealistic expectations for the changes that they hope to achieve. You know, somebody that's like, oh, I got spring break coming up and I really want to fit into this bathing suit. So I want to lose like 35 pounds in the next two months. That's a super unrealistic goal. Is it possible? Well, maybe, I guess. I mean, you could always lop one of your limbs off and that causes that weighs a significant amount that's a good way to lose 30 pounds but they might not really realize what's healthy and how the body works and how metabolism works and how you actually can do more damage and think you can put more of the weight back on when they're done so people in the preparation stage yes they're in a good spot but they also have the best of intentions and really don't know what's on the other side of that fence so they run the risk of being disappointed. So when they start working out and they don't see these benefits that they're looking for right away, because people want things uh, yesterday, they don't want to wait for them. We don't believe in delayed gratification. It's all instant gratification. We live in a Walmart society. I want it now. Oh, it's broken. I just want a new one. These people in this preparation stage, they run the risk of disappointment. And if they get disappointed with what they're seeing as a result of their workouts, <clears throat> dropping out. They're not going to stick around. And then they go back to the pre-contemplation phase. And some of them, you leave a bad enough taste in their mouth, you might have just ruined health and fitness for them for life. And maybe not just you, but just the experience for them. So those um, disappointments, be mindful of them. Action. These are people that are active. Uh, they've started to exercise. It's a regular part of their life, but they've not yet maintained the behavior for six months. So like people that start on um, 
New Year's resolutions, like if they're going for like a full month, they're in the action stage. They're doing it. It's working. Um, but does it stick? And that's where we run into issues, right? Some of the best strategies for keeping people in the action stage are to continue to provide them with education because as they get more interested, more invested, they should understand some more of the advanced concepts and techniques because that's going to keep them moving forward and moving towards other goals and, and, and keep them progressing. They're not going to get stagnant. They're not going to fall out. They're not going to uh, succumb to the barriers of life. You know, when things get in your way and things get inconvenient, people drop out and they stop. Education can help them, and that's going to strengthen their belief in the pros of exercise. And there's tons of good reasons to exercise. And finally, you got the maintenance stage. And these are for people that exercise really is part of their lifestyle. It's not something new. It's not some fad or phase that they're going through. They've been working out for six months or more. And that's a number that's important. Six months. That's the target. Under six months, what they've been doing, it that's action. More than six months, that's maintenance. Now they're just maintaining these lifestyle habits. Even though they formed this change in their behavior and it's pretty much part of their routine, they're not out of the woods. They are still tempted to return to their old habits of less exercise. Look, all it takes is one right set of circumstances to kind of push someone back down the hill. People here, though, they are a little bit more um, resilient, which is good because it's if you do something for six months, that's a pretty long period of time. And chances are that's something that's kind of part of what you're doing. Keep in mind, though, that can change. There are some good strategies to help clients maintain exercise programs. So here's another thing that I want you to do, okay? In that same section, right, the ask questions section of the discussion board, hopefully you've already done your one post. This will, this will be a separate post. Again, don't tell the other students that I did this. This is for you. If you're watching this, you need to know it. Don't talk about it out loud. If somebody didn't watch this video and they missed this chance, that's their fault. Don't help anybody else. This is for you. This is you being a good student. Stages of change. So these are some questions for you to kind of ask yourself. First of all, I want you to answer this question for me, and it's not on these top five. Do you currently exercise as much as you feel that you should? I'm not saying do you get 150 minutes a week or you get in two to three days of resistance training for all body parts. I'm not going off of guidelines. I'm asking you, do you feel like you are doing enough exercising in your life right now? Answer could be yes, could be no. Then I want you to answer these five questions we have on here about yourself. So write them in, so copy them from the slides that you have, put them in there, and I want you to answer them individually. So number one, what experiences with physical activity have you had in the past? Are you a novice exerciser? Did you only do it, like did you play a sport growing up and all you ever did was work out in that sport? Well, that's different than going to the gym and making fitness part of your life. Then think about, you know, again, think about your total global experience. Number two, what worked best to help you stick to an exercise program? If you're like me, you have had experiences with exercise where you've been more successful than others. Why is that? What was it about what you were doing when you were really successful that actually kept you that way? Believe it or not, guys, last year, Last year, like starting in February and over the span of a few months, I lost about 30 pounds. I changed my diet. Um, didn't necessarily make all the best changes. Like there were better ways I probably could have done it, but it worked for me and I was okay with it. Uh, but I also really increased my activity. I made it regular and routine. I was getting 10,000 steps a day. I lost about 30 pounds in a few months. Super successful in that time. As of today, sitting before you recording this, I've gained back, I think, like 23 of those pounds. A yo-yo. Didn't plan well. That is not holding on. I was in the action phase. I didn't make it to maintenance. My life changed. I added a lot more responsibilities, a lot more things picked up. And, and now it's hard for me to, you know, get there at all. So I can talk about all, all of those things. So I can talk about number three, what worked the least? What contributed to quitting an exercise program? I can tell you, when I was most successful in an exercise program, uh, I didn't have children. I didn't have as many children. I didn't have as many jobs. I didn't have as many bills that I had to pay. Those are things that got in the way. 
So those are my honest answers. I'm asking you for yours. So what worked the best? And number two, what worked the least? What are some things that made you quit whenever you, when you did fail? Why? And a personal trainer needs to know that because there's a chance that those kinds of situations will show up again. And a good trainer needs to know how to anticipate those and then how to work you through them because maintenance is the goal. Number four, during the last six months, what kept you from exercising? So this is more recent. This isn't an entire life. This is six months. And then finally, uh, how did they keep up their exercise program when disruptions got in the way, lack of time, travel, holidays? I can tell you for me, I didn't. Those are the things that got in the way. Uh, I've had times where it was better. I mean, when I was younger and I didn't have kids and stuff, I used to be able to exercise on vacation and I didn't feel bad about it. Now, it doesn't work that way. Are those excuses? Maybe. Uh, but they're all choices. Do I want to like neglect my family who I barely see anyway and go, go exercise because that's good for my body? Or do I want to give them my time while I'm here? It's a really tough question that I have to answer. Your questions might be different than mine. I hope that they are. But I'd like to hear from you. So in the discussion section, answer that first question. Do you feel like you get enough exercise right now in your life? Okay, that's number one. And then do these five. If you do that, that's five more points. So just by listening to this lecture, by keying in on these two specific areas, that's 10 additional points on your exam. Pays to watch these things. All right, we're going to kind of roll through the rest of this pretty quickly because I'm spending a lot of time here. When they come in, when somebody comes in to work out with you, explain your policies, procedures, and expectations. Lay everything out on the line. Some people actually will do a contract with their client. It's not part of the standard paperwork that you see from NASM or legal, but it's kind of an expectations contract and it lays everything out. Think about like the syllabus that you guys signed for me at the beginning of each month. Policies, procedures, my expectations of you, so you know what's expected. You can't come to me later and say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, yes, you did. We talked about it the first day. You signed off on it. Those are your responsibilities. You can do that as a personal trainer too. Uh, be sensitive to your client, to your client's feelings, and connect emotionally to them. Be empathetic, not sympathetic. You know, if somebody's having a bad time or they're going through a rough spot, be there for them. Let them know that you understand them, but don't encourage downtrodden feelings and negativity. That's the difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy kind of just throws in with someone and invalidates negative feelings and, and kind of pours onto it. Whereas empathy is more active listening and says, I, I understand and I feel for you, but I'm here to help you get better. That's the big difference. Be consistent uh, along with your style and your person you work with. Be positive, lots of good communication, encourage support, Positive reinforcement is huge, not punishment, positive reinforcement. All things that come from that psychology class will be in. Uh, and greet your clients with a hello and a smile every time. Look, I should be doing that with you guys every morning. Most of the time I do, but there's mornings I come in from traffic or the rain and I'm you know, stressed and worried and I walk in and you know what? I'm setting the whole day off on a bad note. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not perfect. We all make those mistakes, but... In personal training, that's your money. People are going to come back to see you. And how do you want to be received? How's your show? How is the show that you're putting on every day? Make it good. Hello and a smile. And not for fake, for real. Nonverbal. Uh, not just about what you say, but little things about your body too. Uh, things can show in your face, such as small movement in the lips, changing the eyes. These are little subtle nuances that can impact your communication a lot. Listen well. It's not about talking, it's about listening. And that doesn't mean just kind of going, uh-huh, uh-huh, and nodding in the, in the right areas and looking at your phone or multitasking. Active listening is about having an attitude and a genuine interest in seeking a client's perspective and getting to know him or her. This is a people-oriented business. Make those relationships, build that trust. That will keep people working, accomplishing their goals, and they will be retained for you so that you can be successful. I'm not gonna go a lot on this. Just know that there are things that do influence people and their habits of exercise. Uh, people look for different kinds of support. Each of these support mechanisms has a significant impact on their successes or failures. If you're going to take any more quizzes on this, I recommend you go look more at the book about instrumental, emotional, informational, and companionship support. 
They're all different. They all have their unique identifiers. You will go over them more in the psychology class just a few short months from now. This one here though, we can speak about briefly. There's a lot of people in someone's lives that can influence how they are about exercise. They can either help them or hinder their abilities to reach their fitness and wellness goals. I want you to think about just married couples, for instance. If you have a wife or a husband that comes in and they're coming in by themselves and their spouse is not interested and their spouse eats completely different and has different expectations, do you think that that person is going to be successful? Something's got to give, right? Either they're going to give in and do what the other person's doing and so they're not going to benefit or they're going to stick to their guns, be stubborn, and then they're going to have relationship problems and then they're going to get divorced and they're not going to need money to come to you anyway. Um, I'm extrapolating maybe a bit too far, but family relationships can build you up or break you down. It's better to have a supportive system that is behind you. Families that work out together, you know, small group training, maybe a husband and wife as clients. My brother's a personal trainer. He has a lot of husband and wife clients. It makes a lot of sense. I can tell you too from being a married man. When my wife and I are on the same page with fitness, we get a lot done. When we're not and we're kind of at odds with one another, things kind of fall apart. It's like, oh, I want to go out to eat tonight. No, I have to exercise. Oh, I never get to see you. Why this? What? It all falls apart. Same thing with families. Oh, you need to come over for dinner this Sunday. We're having pasta, 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 pasta. <laughs> it's detrimental. Uh, parental, exercise leaders, exercise groups. Being involved in those groups, that can have a really positive impact. Um, can have a negative impact too if they're not good or not safe, but largely I'd say that's in the positive. And that's not limited to just those people. Peers, friends, who you go out with, all that stuff. Barriers. These are the, these are the excuses, if you will. Sticking to a regular exercise schedule, it's not easy, especially for someone new to exercise when they don't really know what they're doing. Lots of potential barriers and obstacles for an individual to overcome. The number one reason people give for not exercising or not sticking with it is time. I'm going to tell you something right now, and this goes for me too. I always talk about I don't have time, but I have just as much time as all of you, and you all have as much time as I do. We all have the same 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 365 in a year. That is absolute. That is unchanging. How we manage it, how we fill that time, well, that's up to us. In the stress management course I teach, we actually do a whole chapter on time management. That's in a couple months for me. I can't wait because you know what? It's an area that I sometimes struggle in. It's always good to go back to those lessons because there's no, nothing better than managing your time well. Unrealistic goals are a barrier. If somebody you know doesn't know what they're getting into and they think they're going to get something they don't, knocks them down. That social support we just talked about, anxiety. Look, some people get nervous. They don't like, you know, some people are nervous just by the gym. You know, you or I might be totally comfortable walking into a gym and picking up dumbbells and going into a room and doing squats and it's totally fine for us. But other people might not. Some people are intimidated by the big buff gym guys. Some of those are uh, intimidated by the girls that some of you guys were talking about in like the tight matching leggings and the sports bras and all the makeup, people get intimidated by all that. And then there's other anxieties too. If people don't feel as confident in their ability. They don't know how to move, how to do the exercises. It's too much. They can go away. So that's one. And then convenience. People always talk about convenience. That's why it's always good to have lots of options up close. Don't make people have to work too hard for it. And the last thing we'll do here is talk about SMART goals. SMART is an acronym, and we'll break it down one by one. So the S in SMART, specific. A specific goal is one that is clearly defined in such a way that anyone can understand what the intended outcome is. So if you come into the gym and say, oh, I just want to get more fit for the summer, what does that mean? That is not specific. It's not going to work. Let's start talking about what you actually want. Oh, I want to shave 30 seconds off of my run time in a 5K before the fall when we have our big 5K season. Oh, look at that. Very specific. Next is measurable. Again, when I said, um, oh, I want to get fit for the summer. Like, okay, fit, you know, maybe some push-ups, sit-ups, some cardio. Uh, but what are we measuring? Like, there's no numbers that we can go with. I don't know what we can improve. I don't even know where we're starting. 
goals need to be quantifiable. There needs to be a number that we can work with that we can modify. Establish a way to assess the progress toward each goal. So find out what the goal is and then find a way to see where they are today and where you need to go. If a goal can't be measured, you can't achieve it, period. Attainable is the next one. And this can get confused with the one after that. So pay attention here. Attainable goals are the right mix of goals that are both challenging, but not over the top. Goals that are too easily accomplished, they don't stretch a client and they don't make them grow as a person, they're not challenging enough, and that's gonna not keep somebody motivated and driven. On the other side of that, that example I said earlier, like, oh, I wanna lose 30 pounds, 35 pounds in two months. Can you even, is that even possible? That's crazy. Maybe oh, 10 pounds in two months. I know that uh, you could get two pounds a week, four weeks. That's eight pounds a month there. You get an extra one. You, maybe you work a little harder. Like, sure, that's attainable. And that's still hard because, again, a healthy weight loss is two pounds a week. 20 pounds in two months. That's pretty ambitious, but that's attainable. 30 pounds? I don't know. That's not really what I would consider attainable. And, oh, they're going to use one pound this month. Oh, yay. You can go to the bathroom and come out with a different number if that's what you want, if that's what your metric is. So attainability really is all about how, that right balance of challenging but not extreme. And then the next one, realistic. So I can set goals that are specific, measurable, like, right, I know what the goal is. I know how I want to measure it. It's totally possible, right, in theory. But realistic is different. Realistic means, is it something that someone's gonna actually do? Are they really gonna be willing and able to work on it? A goal is probably realistic if the individual truly believes that it can be accomplished. Look like for me, like I can set some goals about what I would like to change. And there are things that I would like to change about my health and fitness. But realistically right now, with the way my schedule's set up, I don't know. I don't know if that's really something that I can like it's it's attainable in theory but realistically unless something changes maybe not so that's where realistic is different than attainable not possible this is are you actually going to do it and then finally you got to have a date you should always have a specific date of completion it should be again realistic not too distant in the future so that I want to lose 30 pounds in two months maybe too much 30 pounds in three months now we're talking that's a bit, it's still ambitious, but it's not overly so. It's something that you can do and that's not too far away. Achieved in tomorrow and the next three months. So short-term goals, long-term goals. Again, uh, my stress management course in some of the other classes that you have, we will really talk a whole lot more about goal setting and how to do this properly in short versus long-term. So there's that. This is just the basics. And finally, your benefits of exercise. You know it's good, I know it's good, everybody needs to know it's good. It makes your mood better, less stress, better sleep, not as depressed. Exercise is medicine. You don't need to go see a pharmacist for everything. I'm not you know, saying don't get any medicine out there at all. I know it serves a purpose, but exercise can do a whole lot to improve a lot of factors in your life. All right, gang, that's it, that's all. I will post all the other PowerPoints as well. Uh, I want you to look at them, especially if you're gonna take this exam, which I hope that you are. I, feel, I hope that you feel like I've done enough to prepare you on my end, but we've only had four weeks. We've had to move through at an aggressive, accelerated pace. That's kind of how Kaiser offers things. If you're serious about taking this exam coming up, make sure that you go back through all these slides. You actually read that book. You go through those charts. You know your overactive, underactive muscles. You take all the practice exams, all of them, the long ones, the short ones, everything, and make sure you're really solid on things. Thank you all so much for watching this. Don't forget what we talked about earlier in this presentation. Uh, looking forward to seeing that. Thanks, everybody. Come on.